Howdy, I'm John Sharp, Chancellor of the Texas A&M University System. Welcome to the 12th and final episode of COVID-19, the Texas A&M University System Response. For our finale, we want to dig deeper and look forward in a couple of critical areas. Later, I'll be joined by two guests from earlier episodes, Dr. Peter Hotez, a Hagler Institute scholar at Texas A&M and a vaccine researcher at Baylor College of Medicine, and Dr. Gerald Parker, a veterinary scientist and pandemic preparedness policy expert here at A&M. The three of us will talk about how scientists and policymakers need to do a better job of working together if we're ever going to be back to this pandemic and future pandemics. But before that, I'll visit with Dr. James Samuel. His lab at Texas A&M Health Science Center is ground zero for one of our important partnerships with private industry in this COVID-19 fight. Dr. Samuel is a Regents Professor and the head of the Department of Microbial Pathogenesis and Immunology in the College of Medicine. For 35 years, Dr. Samuel has researched the respiratory disease Q fever, a bacterial infection causing flu-like symptoms in both animals and humans. It often causes problems for people who work in farming, veterinary medicine, and animal research. Dr. Samuel has worked on vaccine candidates against Q fever for more than 20 years. He's testing a vaccine candidate in the fight against COVID-19 also. He works with an international biotechnical company iBio Inc., which has a manufacturing facility nearby here in Bryan, Texas. I think you'll find his research fascinating. Well, welcome, Dr. Samuel. Uh, first of all, tell us what you're working on with the, with the vaccine having to do with uh, COVID-19 at iBio. Yes, yeah, so iBio has developed uh, vaccine candidates for uh, preventing COVID-19, and they use the platform at their manufacturing center in College Station, which uses tobacco plants to express uh, vaccine materials, and then that vaccine material is gonna be tested by Texas A&M Health Science Center, people from my group and other groups, and then we'll test the suitability of the vaccine, and then ultimately the intention is to, uh, with a partnership with uh, IDRI Seattle, to uh, evaluate manufacturing and formulation through the C. Adam or the Center for uh, Innovation for Advanced Manufacturing on campus. So as a vaccinologist, what are you most eager to learn about COVID-19? Well, I think one of the biggest questions about COVID-19 is the way that COVID-19 infection leads to an unusual immune response, an attenuated immune response compared to normal viral infections. And so that uh, ability to cause an unusual vir uh, immune response makes the discovery and formulation of a vaccine much more complicated. And that will include being able to develop vaccines that are eff effective against people that have the highest risk of disease and mor mortality. And so I think though the early vaccinations will be effective against healthy people, healthcare workers and those, but whether they're significantly protective against those with comorbidities and aging uh, individuals is still an outstanding question. So you're working on a preclinical trial. Tell us what that is. What's the nuts and bolts about a preclinical trial? Yes, so a preclinical trial traditionally uses one or more animal models that model the human disease and infect those animals. Uh, first test the vaccine efficacy for its ability to generate an immune response and then test the ability in those immunized animals for protection. So uh, the most traditional animal model and the animal model we'll use is a mouse. So what's the timeline of all of this? You do your preclinical studies, uh, trial, and then it moves to, to what? When, 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 what's the timeline for an answer on so a vaccine? So we began the vaccinations for this experiment to test their, vac their vaccine materials at the beginning of June. By mid-July, we'll have the first set of data to look at correlates of immune response to the vaccine materials. So if, if, if you're successful, everything comes up roses in the preclinical and the, in the clinical trial, mm -hmm. what is the earliest that your vaccine would be available to the public? Well, I think that it's reasonable to imagine for any vaccine that is moving forward at this time to uh, imagine that the general public would be uh, vac available for vaccination 
by the second half of 2021. I believe that's what Dr. Fauci at the NIH has suggested, and I agree with that uh, timeline. Yeah, what are these, I mean, I've seen some press reports that uh, Moderna and Novartis uh, are, are suggesting that they'll have a vaccine in the fall and things like that. What, what's all that about? So there are different ways to formulate vaccines, and the Moderna is an example of nucleic acid-based stimulation directly in a patient without manufacturing a protein or vi viral materials. But all of those would depend on the way that phase evaluation is for clinical trials. And so clinical trials for vaccines traditionally go through a pathway of phase one to show that there's no harm to the vaccinees, and then phase two and possibly combined with phase three to show efficacy. One of the, uh, the timeline constraints about any vaccine evaluation is that it depends on natural population infection. Uh, there has been some discussions about whether populations may be, choose the opportunity to be infected intentionally, but I don't believe that will happen because of bioethical considerations at this time. I mean, it seems like competition is good, right? So what, what, what's the primary advantage of having so many different, uh, different uh, vaccine candidates out there in trials? Yeah, as you say, uh, competition is good. And of course, this is completely unprecedented to have this many candidates at this stage of development. But I would also argue that the vaccine challenge before the world is a lot more complicated than a single vaccine because you have a variety of patients peoples that you need to protect. First of all, you have to have the ability to manufacture on a, on a scale that's never been approached, right? We have vaccinated uh, major parts of the world for a couple diseases and eradicated smallpox and nearly eradicated polio, for example. But that effort took over 20 years and international, uh, uh, international cooperation that is unprecedented. So, for us to be able to vaccinate the world population, it will take many formulations, I would suppose. But tell us about the, your department or the College of Medicine here at A&M uh, with Dr. Cirillo, you and others are involved in the BCG uh, treatment, which was a tuberculosis um, vaccine, I yes, think. Uh, where is that trial and, and what's, what's happening with that? That trial is ongoing right now. They're enrolling uh, healthcare workers to be vaccinated with BG, BCG as a way to augment the innate response against other uh, infections, including COVID-19. Uh, they have just applied to expand the definition of who are healthcare workers to include all those that work in, within the, the healthcare facility as well as first responders to expand the, the group that can enroll. Do you have an opinion on, on the reports? Uh, I think first out of Italy and some other places that, the, that, the, that COVID-19 seems to be weakening. So when we analyzed that set of studies last week, I have to say that that wasn't, um, wasn't convincing to us. I think one of the unusual situations that the scientific community finds itself in right now is that they're so hungry for any information that studies are published in high impact journals in which a fragment, uh, traditionally a fragment of the necessary information to make a significant conclusion is being presented. And so I think that everybody is so eager to find a magic bullet, the solution, good news, that uh, I think that science waits until significant uh, demonstration has been provided. Well, Dr. Samuels, thank you for being here. Thank you for what you do for Texas A&M and for, and for our country in these trying times. We appreciate it. Thank you, sir. If the field of scientific study had rock stars, both of my next guests would be selling out stadiums. Dr. Gerald Parker is director of the Pandemic and Biosecurity Policy Program at Texas A&M's Bush School of Government and Public Service and Associate Dean for Global One Health at the College of Veterinary Medicine here. He's widely known as one of the nation's top experts on defending against emerging public health threats. 
He's held leadership positions in biodefense at the U.S. Departments of Defense, Homeland Security, and Health and Human Services. Dr. Peter Hotez is a professor and dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine at Baylor College of Medicine and co-director of the Texas Children's Hospital Center for Vaccine Development in Houston. A physician scientist, Dr. Hotez is internationally recognized for his work on otherwise neglected diseases. He's considered one of the globe's most influential people in healthcare. We'll discuss what Texas, the nation, and the world might look like in the coming weeks, months, and years. Dr. Parker is here with me in the KMU studio on the Texas A&M campus, and Dr. Hotez is joining us via Houston uh, Zoom. Welcome to both of you. Let's talk about how we got here. When we first did our show together in April, uh, there were 6,500 deaths in the United States. Today, there are 120,000 deaths in the United States. The modelers are predicting, if it keeps going like it is, that by October 1st, it'll be about 200,000. So we have about a quarter of the deaths of the world, and we only have 4% of the population of the world. So uh, one of you care to tell me what happened? Sure, I'll, I'll, uh, I don't mind starting that question. And actually, there's a lot of people asking that question. And I can tell you, um, with a lot of colleagues I know in, in Washington, D.C., the, the favorite pastime is well underway, and that's finger pointing. What I really believe to really answer this question more thoughtfully and objectively is um, the Congress and the administration actually really should call for a COVID pandemic commission, similar to the 911 commission after the terrorist attacks of 911, because we really need um, somehow to get a bipartisan objective look at this. But what's more important than looking back is looking forward. What's next? We must prevent this from happening again. COVID-19 is not a 100 year event, as some may be saying. Uh, emerging infectious diseases with pandemic potential are a growing, uh, growing concern. And this is, this is not gonna be our last pandemic. Okay. Dr. Hotez? Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. Uh, you know, this is now our third coronavirus uh, serious public health threat of the 21st century. We had SARS, SARS-1 in 2003, MERS in 2012, and, and now this, and this of course is the worst uh, of all by, by a long shot. I think, you know, I think one of the things that if there is a commission that really, we really have to look at is why was virus transmission allowed to go on for so long in this country before it went undetected, before it went detected. So the estimates are this virus entered in New York City probably by the middle of February, and it wasn't well until the end of March that there was a significant effort to lock it down and to in implement the social distancing. So in what uh, hurt Wuhan was what hit, hurt New York City, which is that virus transmission went on for six weeks before there was any public health intervention. In contrast, you know, well, we did pretty well in Texas for quite a long time. Uh, you know, we never saw that big surge on our intensive care units in any of the hospitals in Texas, including our Texas Medical Center here in Houston, where where, where A and M is uh, uh, operating, and we never saw that surge. And part of it was because we saw what was happening in New York, and we implemented that aggressive social distancing. You know, we used to get a lot of information about the world. Last time we were together. Uh, Italy was spiking and going crazy and that you were hearing a lot of stuff about what was happening in the rest of the world. We don't hear too much now. I guess it's because it's so pronounced here, but what is going on in the rest of the world with regard to COVID-19? Well, uh, I'll, I'll do the first part. Um, we're starting now to see a new wave through the what we call the Global South, uh, meaning uh, the Southern Hemisphere countries, so Latin America, India, South Asia, and Sub-Saharan Africa. So Brazil is getting hammered right now. Uh, terrible uh, epidemics in Fortaleza and Belém and Manaus with huge numbers of patients in, in the ICUs. And uh, some are saying that the number of deaths in Brazil may even exceed the number of deaths in the United States. It's just uh, nobody's looking or counting. And now uh, India is starting to get hit very hard and how do you do social distancing in the crowded urban slums of Mumbai or Kolkata or Delhi and and now Africa is getting hit very hard so I think the version 2.0 unfortunately is this huge global health pandemic 
in the low and middle income countries. And that may even be turn out to be the scariest part yet of uh, COVID-19. So Dr. Hotez, what's, what are the most promising medical treatments, not vaccine, but medical treatments that are out there that you see in the medical field? Well, I'm really excited about some of the antibody therapies uh, that are out there. We've last time, if you remember, we spoke about convalescent plasma uh, serum and uh, convalescent plasma. This is uh, blood from patients who've been infected and recovered. We give them back their red blood cells and then we administer the plasma. And there's some early stud early publications now. It's been given to over 4,000 patients in the U.S. It was not done as a randomized control trial, but it looks like it is working. And the other exciting part of this is there are trials underway now to evaluate this not only as treatment early in the course of the infection, but giving it to individuals who've been potentially exposed to the virus, such as our first responders or healthcare providers to prevent them from getting ill. And, and I think that's going to be a game changer provided one, they can scale it up adequately. And second, they don't try to price gouge uh, that they don't charge thousands of dollars a dose. And that's going to, that'll also be uh, an interesting discussion. A game changer by when do you think? I'm hoping within weeks, uh, certainly it'll be uh, ahead of the vaccines because the bar is a bit lower because you're giving it to individuals at high risk or who are already sick. So you'll be able to collect that safety data pretty quickly. The, the vaccines will be a, a longer time horizon. And then that brings us to the other, what about small molecule drugs? Could we develop something like we do for HIV AIDS, which is pre-exposure prophylaxis? Or will we have some small molecule drugs for treatment? And we've heard about Undisivir, uh, which is an antiviral drug, small molecule drug. And that also is looking like it has some promise. So, you know, one of the things I like to say is it's not like you're just, we're just twiddling our thumbs waiting for vaccines to come along. We're doing, we're rolling out a lot of therapy. What do policymakers have to do to uh, help limit the spread, especially in, uh, you know, really vulnerable populations in other nations? Well, I think, I think maybe first and foremost, I think we need to do a better job of just communication, you know, communication about the risk of pandemics. Social distancing remains essential as we go out and about and in the community. Maintaining our distance between other people is, is still very, very important. Um, wearing face uh, masks and coverings is still very, very important to try to minimize community uh, transmission as we go out and about and re-engage our economy and so forth, which we must do. I'm, I'm in the camp that we do need to re-engage and reopen our economy and learn how to safely live with the SARS-CoV-2 virus because it's not going away. Uh, we have to learn how to live safely, as safe as we possibly can and manage the risk. You know, as far as the vulnerable population, we do know more today than we did a month ago about who is at more risk of, of serious disease. And so I think we need to devise, you know, better strategies of how we do protect those at most risk. Um, but that's hard to do because we can't just, you know, separate everybody that may be at a higher risk because um, I, I happen to fall in that higher risk being over 65. Um, but I come in contact with younger people who aren't as high, at risk for, for ser uh, serious disease. The governor in Texas laid out this plan for a sort of phased reopening. Uh, quarter 50 percent. I, I don't think the population really heard the one quarter 50 percent part. I mean, it, once once that there was any lifting at all, once the door was a, was cracked open a bit, we saw what was happening on the beaches in Galveston and uh, along the Texas coast, and the bars were starting to fill up, and uh, and people weren't wearing masks, and uh, it was oh, mostly business as usual in many respects. And now we're seeing this really big surge in Houston, Dallas, and Austin. And then the big question is, will anybody have the political will or appetite to see us dial it back at this point? And so I think this is a new crisis that's facing Texas is uh, what's gonna bring these numbers back down. We're not gonna be able to depend only on biomedical interventions, it's going to uh, it needs something much, much uh, m at a much higher level. Let's talk about d vaccine development, in particular, y y the vaccine that, that you're working on. Where's all that at? So we have a, um, a low-cost recombinant protein vaccine uh, that's expressed in yeast, uh, and 
it's kind of an old school vaccine in the sense that it's uh, this uses the same technology used to make the recombinant hepatitis B vaccine that's made locally in India and Brazil and Bangladesh and, and Indonesia. So we have the hope that this could be one of the first low cost accessible global health vaccines. And we've partnered with a nonprofit called PATH that's based in Seattle. And they do a lot of work at the Gates Foundation to uh, develop uh, the meningococcal A vaccine for Africa, the malaria vaccine. Now they're partnering with us. And so we're hoping to announce uh, any day now that we have a new partnership in India to scale up production and hopefully uh, make the vaccine for India. And, uh, and, and we did that in part because it is a low cost accessible strategy, but also trying to compete with the pharma companies and Operation Warp Shield, we didn't, we didn't think that was going to be very successful. But now when we've seen some of the uh, neutralizing antibody titers from some of the Operation Warp Speed vaccines, we think we indeed might be very, uh, I don't wanna use the word to compete, but we think our vaccine could potentially have, have some advantages. Um, so that's, so we're having those discussions with the FDA and the NIH and it's, uh, it, these are very, it's a very intense time right now and trying to work our way through what's, uh, uh, how we're gonna roll out this Operation Warp Speed vaccine program. Dr. Parker, what about vaccine development that you see from? Oh, I'm, 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 I'm just uh, I'm really um, very excited about um, the commitment uh, that we in the United States and around the world are putting into vaccine development. Um, it's unprecedented, the, the amount of investment and, and trying to move at warp speed, although I don't like the terminology that uh, that program has been given, but it is what it is. Um, but um, the attributes of uh, the vaccine that Dr. Hotez, his laboratory is working on are the exact kind of attributes that we really need. We need a, a vaccine that's gonna be accessible worldwide. And, well, well and here's where you know, a, a university like Texas A&M is gonna be so important. Uh, in, in one of the great features of A&M is, is that it's such a science-driven university, all that engineering and science horsepower, but you also have institutions like the Scowcroft uh, uh, Institute and, and the Bush School. And those two present a very powerful combination. Uh, let me give you an example. One of the big uh, downsides of this vaccine program is it's unfortunately been tied to nationalism. So people are talking about the Chinese vaccine, the American vaccine, the British vaccine. And, and as I tell people, the virus doesn't really care if you're Chinese or British or or, or, or American or even Texan. And, uh, and that, that, and there's even a new term now around this. It's uh, been called vaccinationalism. And it's the exact opposite of what we should be doing, right? Because we know that the only way we're gonna solve this is if countries cooperate to make, uh, both make vaccines and work together to scale up vaccines. Otherwise everybody loses. Well, that so was, navigating that and getting international cooperation on vaccine development, that's right in the sweet spot of the Bush School that has access to the science and the engineering and can help us chart some policies on that. And so Dr. Parker, I'd be really enthusiastic about working with you to help. Obviously, we all believe that there's gonna be a vaccine at some point. Is someone working on mechanisms for mass production? Is someone working on me mechanisms for mass distribution? Or is this gonna be every nation for itself? We need to be thinking about how we're gonna um, have access around the world. Distribution is gonna be a big challenge. Supply chains for just vials, needles, syringes. Who's gonna give the shots? Where are they gonna be given? How are they gonna be given? Uh, and it's, this is gonna be, uh, who's gonna get the first doses? Those are, these are huge policy questions because it, it won't be one day we don't have any vaccine and the next day we have a vaccine for everybody in the world. It's gonna take a long time to ramp up production to have a vaccine that's affordable and accessible to everybody in the world, not to mention just the United States. So these are huge, huge policy and logistic questions that we ought to be talking about now. This is why we need our universities because uh, we have to have this uncomfortable dialogue between the scientists, the engineers, the political scientists, the sociologists, uh, the economists. We need the business schools, we need the law schools. That actually turns out to be the hard part. The science, 
uh, we, we've we've actually we and a number of other groups have solved that it's it's all the other really key pieces to make certain that the science could be leveraged for humanitarian purposes what worries you most uh, and, and what gives you the most optimism well first what worries me the most is, and it's it simply is if the past is prologue we'll get through this crisis and we will not take pandemic preparedness, emerging infectious diseases seriously like we have in the past, and we won't make the political financial resources to have us better prepared so, so that we can prevent this from ever happening again. So what I'm optimistic about, I mentioned you know, a need to have a COVID, COVID com pandemic commission, uh, analogous to the 911 commission, I'm actually hearing and learning of some momentum going forward that that is something that our, our nation needs to, to do. So I'm a, I am optimistic that, uh, um, that we may break through this boom and bust cycle and finally take pandemic preparedness seriously as we should. Dr. Hotez, same two questions. What makes you most fearful, most optimistic? Well, what I'm particularly worried about right now is oh, that this pandemic has created an enormous amount of instability uh, glo globally and nationally. So nationally, we're seeing some uh, a lot of demonstrations uh, coming from both the left and, and the right, and it has definite connections to this, this pandemic. We're starting to see here in Texas uh, people openly opposing uh, masks or social distancing, even contact tracing, uh, and it's linked to the same groups that are opposing vaccines. So th this undercurrent of uh, anti-science uh, that uh, concerns me with increasing targeting of scientists. And, and uh, so I think that's creating a lot of instability and I see that getting worse in the weeks uh, moving up to the 2020 presidential election and then all of the global health gains that we've had over the last 20 years now starting to unravel because of COVID-19. So we're halting polio vaccinations, measles vaccinations, and mass drug treatments for uh, a number of tropical diseases. So I'm worried about the rise of other uh, diseases as well. COVID has revealed so many other weaknesses, exploit so many other weaknesses in our society. I just see a general period of instability unless we can get our arms around this. Hmm. Well, Dr. Hotez, Dr. Parker, thank you so much for being here and thank you both uh, for your contributions to the war against COVID-19 and for all you do for the country and for A&M. Thank you, sir. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. Thank you for tuning in. As I mentioned, this is the final episode of our special series on how the Texas A&M University system is meeting the challenges of COVID-19. It's been a fascinating and educational experience for me, and I've been honored to bring you all kinds of valuable information through the program. In fact, I've enjoyed it so much, we've decided to launch a brand new television series starting this fall. It's called Around Texas with Chancellor John Sharp, and it'll be devoted to experiencing the vast, vast breadth of ways that the Texas A&M system serves and enriches our state, the nation, and the world. So mark your calendar for September 10th, and we hope to see you then.